Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to A Runner's Life podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Obviously, we're having a conversation on the podcast and now on YouTube. Uh, can you give the viewers and the listeners an introduction to who you are? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Scott. I am the creator of Running Explained. Uh, my whole goal is to help explain as best I can the sport of running to runners of all abilities, whether you're a brand new runner or you've run 100 marathons and you've qualified for the Olympics. Um, there's always more to talk about, so I'm here to break it down and and all of that. I am a multi-certified running coach. I work with runners one-on-one. -on -one. I have training plans available and a whole bunch of free content on my Instagram at Running Explained. Awesome. And I love your content. And that's the reason why I wanted you to speak on the show. If you listen to the podcast, we go into a lot more detail about how to self train for a marathon. But in this episode, I really want to do a shorter side a snippet into the mental side. So we're going to be doing some bonus material that's not on the podcast. So talk about the mental side. So the first question from one of the listeners and was, how do you keep mentally resilient when you're not supported by someone else? I think the classic answer is to find the mental resilience from within. Well, humans are social creatures. You know, there are a lot of things where we do need to find the strength within, but we also need to surround ourselves with people who do support us. Um, it's unfortunate that this person is in a situation where they don't feel supported by somebody who should be supported above them, but hopefully they have other people in their life, lives in their life who they can turn to, even if it's strangers on the internet, there is nobody more supportive than the online running community to get that support. Um, and not to get all kind of outside of my lane here, but if you have something that's really serious in your life that you're going for and you feel like your partner or whoever this primary person in your life is not supportive of you, like that might be something that is should be explored. Um, because whatever you're doing in your life, if the people around you are trying to tear you down rather than build you up, it's not going to be a good place for you to be. I totally agree. I think one of the key things that people want to know is like, how can they kind of harness that anxiety during the taper period? Yeah, I love, and I love that you phrased the question this way, how to harness the anxiety. So often we think of anxiety, this kind of adrenaline, the norepinephrine, like all these things that, you know, um, can make us feel anxious are actually, you know, your fight, um, uh, chemicals when you talk about fight or flight right you can actually visualize harnessing that power towards having a really good performance on race day now that being said you don't want to be harnessing the power of your race day anxiety tuesday before your race when it's 11 p.m and you're trying to go to sleep right there are some really simple kind of anti-anxiety or um, anxiety management tools you can use like uh square breathing right if you are getting bent out of shape in an inappropriate time, square breathing where you inhale at a count, hold your breath for a count, and then exhale for a count, like four, hold for four, exhale for four, do that a couple of times. That rhythmic breathing actually engages your parasympathetic nervous system, basically your rest and digest system, which counteracts your fight or flight uh, system. So that can be one way to kind of calm yourself down when you are anxious in an inappropriate time. But on race day, what you can do is visualize that anxiety actually being used in your favor, right? I like to, on race day, when I get very nervous, like so nervous that I'm just nauseous, I like to remind myself, like, this is supposed to feel this way. This is actually a good thing. You want to be amped up. You want to be excited. And really just think about it being a good thing rather than a negative thing for your performance. Um, but one of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with in their taper, especially if it's a really big race or maybe it's their first marathon, is that they really struggle with believing that they've done enough to prepare for race day. And that this is really when you have to kind of let go because there's nothing more you can do, which is really hard for a lot of people. We are used to striving and working as hard as we possibly can. We're used to doing more, more, more. If I have a goal, I will work towards it. Part of your taper is doing less and not actually putting the work in. The work is to do less or to do nothing. For a lot of people, they are so anxious that they haven't done enough, then they then go and do too much in their taper, right? So then they actually might be sabotaging themselves for race day. And then it's this self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, I didn't do enough. Oh, I, then my race was bad. And oh, I got, you know, and have all these kind of negative associations with it. So um, in your taper, one of the things that's really important to do is to also remember to trust your training, to believe 
that what you're doing is the correct thing, to believe that you've put in the work, the hundreds of miles, all the hours running, and to kind of like let it go. Because what's going to happen is going to happen. There's nothing you can do three days before a race day to change the outcome of a race in a except in the negative way. Like you can go run too hard on your shakeout run and, and get tire yourself out for race day, but there's no additional fitness you can gain during your taper. Um, so, you know, if this is a struggle for you, like if you are genuinely feeling like your anxiety or stress levels are unmanageable during your taper, this might be a really good time to talk to somebody like a sports psychologist or even just a regular therapist about those feelings. Um, running is really great for our mental health, but running is not a replacement for actual therapy. And sometimes, you know, we talk about managing stress, managing anxiety. For some people, box breathing is a great tool. For some people, that's not going to be nearly enough. Um, so yeah, do what you can. If you need help, go get extra help. But remember that you are you have done all you can do. And it's just time to finish out your taper and glide on into race day as rested as you can be. I think that's such an important point to go back to that you've done everything you can do. Or even if you think you haven't done enough, there's nothing else that you can do within that last week or two weeks. So it's kind of just like show up, do your best on the day. Yeah. Like if you missed your last long run, this happens a lot, especially because, you know, peak weeks tend to be the highest mileage, most intensity. It's a really stressful time. If you're going to have any little injury pop up, it might be in your peak weeks. And I've worked with runners who couldn't get their last long run in because of whatever reason or family emergency or things happen. That That is like you can't make it up. And that's okay. Like it's, you have to just roll on past it, right? There's nothing more you can do. You cannot make anything up in your taper. Um, sometimes life is what it is. And yeah, don't, please don't do your last long run. Don't, please don't run 20 miles the week before race day. Please don't. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know, you're approaching the last night to be honest, and you're feeling nervous. Don't worry. Everyone else is feeling exactly the same thing. You're not, weird for feeling like that yeah and i'll also say um if you are the kind of person who has trouble sleeping the night before a big race you can actually intentionally sleep more in the days leading up to your race um you can bank sleep to a little bit of a degree right so if you know yourself and you think i never sleep the night before race or i get two or three hours of sleep um if you are going into that situation already kind of on the cusp of being sleep deprived, that actually is going to impact you on race day. If you spent the week or two weeks leading up to that race, pre-race night, really making sure you're getting enough sleep, if not a little bit more than normal, that's going to help negate that night that of poor sleep right before race day. Okay. That's a really good tip, actually. Thank you for sharing that. I don't know if you do this as well, but sometimes like the night before i just try to watch like comedies or things that make me laugh beforehand because obviously you've got the nerves but it's like i just don't think it's the right time to expend that kind of focus i kind of really want to save it for race morning you know i want to save those rocky speeches <laughs> before time before it matters before using it too soon yeah, I would say probably uh, reruns of The Office are a good idea the night before a race, not some very emotional documentary about a very deep topic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anything that's going to induce tears or well, sad tears or anything like deep thinking, probably say that for another day. So you obviously, you know, it's race morning. You you got up, you're heading down to start line and you've got your race day plan, but then you've got reality. How do we kind of manage those two opposite forces? Yeah, this is when the planning part is so huge. Uh, part of the things that I work with my runners about when making their race day plan is not just about the logistics, where you're going to be, what are you going to wear, what you're going to eat, how fast we're going to run, what are, what are our pacing strategies, but also managing the anxiety, managing how things could go during the race and preparing. So when you're goal setting for any race, um, it helps. It's helpful to have what we call ABC goals, and you can go through. You can have as many goals as you want. You can go A through Z goals. But basically, the goal, your A goal, should be like on a perfect day. If everything turns out really well, I will achieve this big goal, right? So, for let's say, for, as an example, let's say your A goal is to run a Boston qualifying time, right? Um, your B goal, let's say, you know, the goal that you would be comfortable with, put a good effort on, still have a good race, but not quite get the A goal. 
maybe you run a PR, but you don't quite hit the BQ, right? So you've still achieved a big goal on your race day, whatever your times are, where you're coming from. Your C goal, let's say you match your PR, right? I'm using a hypothetical runner as an example. A D goal, finish, right? <laughs> or D goal, finish without walking. You know, E goal, all these things you can run down. So having those specific goals, but then in the race, you also want to have work through hypothetical situations about how the race could go and how you will respond in the moment. So what this looks like and what I do with my runners is I have them write out scenarios that they identify or imagine could happen to them, especially if the course has challenges, right? Like hills in a certain situation, or if they have run previous races and encountered certain mental roadblocks previously, we write out and work through those situations, right? So let's say um, you get to mile 10 and you're actually feeling like the effort's harder than you expected it to be. How will you respond? right? How would, how will you respond to that situation? So working through that situation. Um, but also happy, remember to set the expectation of it's not going to feel easy. And I think this is something that we struggle with. We talk about the terminology of marathon pacing a lot is that, Oh, the first, you know, 10 miles should feel really relaxed. And the second 10 miles should feel, you know, like you're pushing a little bit. And the last 10 K is really hard. Well, to be fair, you know, marathon pace is never going to feel like an easy run, right? if you go in expecting it to feel like you're just at, on a, on a recovery jog, no, like you're there to work. Now you don't want to work too hard too early, but a mistake that I made, and I know that a lot of other runners make is when you go in expecting it to feel really easy. And then all of a sudden it doesn't, or it feels harder than you expected it to feel. Even if in retrospect, it feels as it should feel, but you didn't expect it to feel that way. It's actually that mismatch between expectation and reality that causes your brain to have a little bit of a short circuit and causes you to freak out and start having all those doubts and all those dark thoughts and then tanks you. So set the mental expectation of how things might feel on like a regular day, but then also identify what possible rough patches or dark spots you could foresee and how, what mental skills you will employ to work past them. Because if you have thought through them previously, if one of them happens in the race, you know what to do. You don't have to expend the mental energy going, Oh my God, I don't know what to do. You think, ah, I remember I worked through this on my worksheet. I remember that I had negative thoughts last time at mile 18. And all I had to do was just turn on my other song, whatever it is, whatever your specific strategy is, have a plan. You you can, you can plan. And if you plan for it, you're going to be in a much better place. So many great points there. And you're so right. I think expectation is such a key part. Like you're saying, if you've got those things listed out then you've at least thought about it and it's not and you're not saying that this for example like you're going to think of every single eventuality what you are saying what you're giving your run is like you're equipping them with the skills to be able to problem solve on the run and deal with that challenge or something else that may occur Correct. Like we're not going to go through a situation where a seagull comes and steals your water bottle, right? We're not going to go through like every possible eventuality, but we're going to identify, especially if the runner, you know, if you're a marathon, if you're running a marathon, hopefully you've run other races previously. This isn't your very first race, but thinking back through your experience in previous races, what kind of your sticky patches have been things, you know, about yourself and how your thought patterns tend to be, right? Are you a person who goes negative really, really quickly, or do you have a bit more resilience than that? You know, so identifying all of that and kind of working through the common situations that could arise during the marathon, you know, most, most people are going to have at least one rough patch in their marathon. Um, sometimes that rough patch is a long, long patch, but expect expecting to encounter at least one rough patch, I think will also help you so that if you encounter no rough patches, you have what you call a unicorn of a race, you are pleasantly surprised, but kind of expecting that at some point, I know I'm going to, I know I'm going to have some trouble. If you expect to have some trouble at some point, when, or if you do encounter that trouble, um, you'll be prepared. You'll be prepared. I think that's the best way to do it because like you're saying, if you go into it without expectation, then it does hit you like a ton of bricks because it's not something you thought about. But conversely, if you don't have any issues, not that you're willing these things to happen, but if it doesn't happen, then it's it's a it's a real bonus because you know you don't have to experience that. But I think yeah, definitely the mental side is so important. And you think about the things that go well, like you're saying, but also think about the things that could challenge you. I think it's just like trying to make sure you think about those things. I'm not going to put a percentage on it because I don't want people to be like, quote me like, you said 20% here and 80% there. <laughs> so, 
And I think one of the biggest things is that is that mismatch of when you expect to have to work hard. And I, I had a guest on my podcast a little bit ago um, who was talking about, and she's a, she's a professional runner, and she was talking about a situation where she uh, had to – she knew – she has run enough marathons. She knows that there's a point in every marathon where you start having to really work hard physically and mentally, right? And she had a situation in her in her race, which she ended up winning. She won this marathon that she had to work harder earlier than she had planned on. And that keyword was that she had planned on, not that she expected to, right? She was thinking, I, she already went into her race knowing at some point during this race, I'm going to have to really work. I'm going to have to work for this. This is going to be a grind. This is going to be a struggle. I'm going to have to do some work. But that happened earlier than she had planned on. It turned out well for her, um, but she had that she had the the planning in place about this is going to happen at some point, and I'm going to have to be prepared for that. Um, I think the thing that a lot of people kind of think that when they encounter a struggle in the race, that means that their race is somehow over. And I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for being able to do things that are hard for longer than we expect to be able to do them, right? So if you were thinking only only the last six miles is going to be hard but it starts feeling hard at mile 16. That doesn't mean you cannot run the last 10 miles and have it be a struggle. Just because it's harder earlier than you expected doesn't mean you're incapable of doing it. Just means you're gonna have to work a little bit harder than you'd expected to earlier than you planned. Yeah, it's a great point. I think, yeah, just about being adaptable with that expectation. Challenges come and sometimes you have your best race, but you still have lots of challenges during that race. People see the PRs or the times and they think, oh, it must have been a breeze for you. But sometimes, you might have challenges but still get a PR. Sometimes you might not have challenges and still get a PR. You just never know how it's going to turn out on the day. Actually, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, Kira D'Amato, who just set the women's uh, American women's marathon record, she talked about how the race went for her. And you would think, you know, she broke a record. I bet that was the best race of her life. I bet she felt amazing the whole time. She talked about how she didn't really feel good at any point during that race. She ran the entire race feeling not great, like not in the zone, not grooving, not like you would expect a record running race to feel like. And I think that alone just shows the power of what you can do, even when you don't feel great, you can still run PRs or break records on a day where you just feel meh. <laughs> what does she credit that down to, you think? I mean, the mental strength, you know, she's, um, I don't know. I have to go back and read the interview more fully. You know, her story is amazing in that she took such a break from running for so long and then came back. Um, and she's in her late thirties. She has kids and she has a you know husband, she's family. And she, I don't think she's working as a full-time realtor anymore, but she was when she wrote that record, broke that record. And I think just the, the ability for her to just kind of put her head down and do it anyways. Right. To, yeah, it's hard. But it's one, it's supposed to be hard. And two, what are you going to do about it? Like, what are you going to do about it? And something I actually not at all compare myself to her, something I like to tell myself when I'm in a place in a race where I'm really struggling. And I used this in my last marathon, but halfway through when it got, you know, okay, I'm working harder early than I expect to. Um, I had to keep reminding myself that it's not going to get any easier from here. So if I keep wishing it were easier, all I'm doing is opening up these doors that I can't walk through, right? So I'm looking at this beautiful, easy garden, garden on the other side. I can't go there. Why am I even tempting myself with this, right? So you have to remind yourself that, you know, that put your focus where it's supposed to be, remove what you wish could happen, focus on what is happening, um, and just do it, right? And sometimes, you know, I'd like to say that these are foolproof strategies and that if you just put your head down and grind through, you'll always get a PR and you're never going to bonk. That's not true. You might have hit such a rough patch that does derail you. That does happen. People drop out of marathons all the time, even elite runners, but you're always going to learn something from it so you can perfect your strategy and try again next time. Absolutely. And I think the good thing about listening to that example is it just shows that you don't have to be elite to, you know, back of the pack. We all kind of feel the same things, experience the same experiences. So thank you for sharing that. And if anyone is not following Elizabeth, do check out Instagram at Run Explained. The content that you produce, the value you give is amazing. So I'm really grateful to have spoken to you today on the YouTube channel and also on the podcast. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me.